Manx Radio's update with Beth Espy. Fast am I. Good evening and welcome to Update on Thursday the 19th of September. How are you? Here is your daily roundup of what's been happening on the Isle of Man. Coming up in the next half hour, meat plant changes. Could the flight route between the Isle of Man and Northern Ireland be saved? There's a call for the DOI to pay towards the Northern Civic Amenity Site or face losing it. And are you having any hedge issues in your area? All that plus we'll keep an eye on the roads and see if there's anything to look out for on your way home or indeed if you're travelling off island this evening and if you'd like to get in touch we'd love to hear from you you can text 166177 or you can email studio at manxradio.com first let's join siobhan for a look at the main news headlines Substantial changes to the board of the Isle of Man Meats meat plant have been made with immediate effect. DEFA says it follows months of review and consideration. Five new directors have now been appointed, including a new chair, who have experience in retail, butchery and agriculture. Manx Utilities says its wind speed monitoring tests at Eristane Plantation are now complete. Over the past 12 months, data has been collected to allow for various turbine designs at the site. The SODAR device has now been removed and returned to the UK. New safety measures have been introduced to enable a quick and effective response should an outbreak of the blue tongue virus occur here. It's as the virus continues to spread to more farms across England. Government has confirmed the Isle of Man remains unaffected at this time. Villa Gaiety wants feedback on plans to allow alcohol within the theatre auditorium. The venue says it's planning to apply to the Isle of Man Licensing Court to permanently extend the licensed area to cover all public areas. An FC Isle of Man's manager says it's been a privilege to work with Luke Murray, who announced this week he's leaving the club. The striker confirmed yesterday afternoon he was stepping back from the game indefinitely due to an ongoing heart condition. Further afield, the leader of Hezbollah says pager explosions in Lebanon could be a de- declaration of war and accused Israel of crossing red lines. 37 people have died following the blasts. A security company has admitted some prisoners freed early in the UK under a scheme to ease overcrowding in jails there haven't been electronically tagged. And a prolific shoplifter has been banned from all but three shops in northeast England. 43-year-old Tanya Liddell from Newcastle has 171 convictions to her name. There are your headlines. I'll have the news for you at six. Thanks very much indeed, Siobhan. Now the weather brought to you by Manx Glass and Glazing. And it's another good one tonight. Dry and sunny, light easterly winds and minimum temperatures of 11 Celsius overnight. There might be some cloud around at first tomorrow, but otherwise, again, another fine day. Lengthy spells of sunshine and generally light winds. Temperatures rising to around 19 in the afternoon. And good news for the weekend as well. It will be mainly sunny, just the small risk of the odd shower. Sunset this evening will be at 7.23. Sunrise tomorrow morning, just after 7. Manx Glass and Glazing don't just do the big jobs. It's easy to repair broken greenhouse glass at Manx Glass and Glazing. For greenhouse glass cut to size, call 674 573. See the island like you've never seen it before on an incredible chauffeur-driven trike tour. A unique way to make memories that will last a lifetime. Gift vouchers available too. See iomtriketours.com for details and booking. One architectural design company has particular expertise in achieving planning approval for a wide variety of projects, from landmark buildings to spectacular homes. Talk to the experts at Ellis Brown and get your project off the ground. For excellence in design, search Ellis Brown. Your business can grow its market share four times faster. Be heard by over 43,000 island adults over 13 weeks. Call us on 682 600. Manx Radio is proud to support Manx businesses and communities. Firestone Rubber Roof Shop for one-piece flat roofing systems. No joins, no leaks. We also line commercial box gutters in one piece up to 60 metres with a 20-year written warranty against leakage. Call Rubber Roof Shop on 49667. You're listening to Update on Manx Radio. It's four and a half minutes past five. Now, the board which runs the Northern Civic Amenity Site says it needs the Department of Infrastructure to provide financial support to cover the running costs of the site since Bride pulled out of the agreement. In a letter seen by the local democracy reporting service, the committee says there's been a lack of solutions provided by DOI. Well, local democracy reporter Emma Draper has been following the story and joins us now. 
Emma, what does the letter say about the financial situation? So it's asking the department for £67,000, which is the amount that bride commissioners were paying before they pulled out. The letter says that without the financial covering from the Department of Infrastructure, then the board will have to exit the site. Now, bride's contribution was 14% of the total running cost. The full cost is £480,000. The letter states the board can only continue if the current and future shortfalls are covered by the department. Now, can you just take us back to the beginning and tell us how this situation all came about? So in April, it was revealed that Bride had pulled out of the NCAS for financial reasons, claiming the rate system being used to finance it was unfair. Each local authority represented on the committee pays a cost based on the rateable value of the area. After that, Bride put in place a number of waste management solutions for residents, including a man with a van, whilst ID checks were introduced at the amenity site to ensure only those paying towards it were able to use it. The letter I have here says Bride remains determined to ignore logic and respect for the rate system which pays for services. So what options and solutions have been suggested to the Department of Infrastructure in that letter you have? There are a number, the main one being that the DOI pays the £67,000 shortfall. It also suggests direct action be taken by the DOI to remove Bride's business rate contributions or ceasing rent on skip movements to the local authority's former contribution value. Another option is to charge the DOI for staffing and Weybridge station costs, specifically when items are due to be taken to Ride Pit North to balance the contribution. The letter also says the committee wants to work with the department, not against it. And it's requested a response by Monday the 7th of October in time for the rate setting process. Emma, thank you very much indeed. Now we have contacted the DOI for comment and they've told us the Department of Infrastructure is committed in April to work with the Northern Civic Amenity Site Joint Committee and this remains the case. No further comment will be issued at this stage. The chair of the Northern Civic Amenity Site Board has declined to be interviewed and previously we have invited bride commissioners to comment but they've told us that since they've not contributed financially or operationally to the site since the 31st of March this year, they have nothing to add. Coming up to seven and a half minutes past five. The Isle of Man Airport is in talks with another airline about saving the flight route between Ronalds Way and Northern Ireland. Now, this comes after EasyJet dropped the Belfast service. Passengers can no longer book travel there past the 25th of October. Hannah Lebeo is head of commercial at the Isle of Man Airport. Just the load factors or the ticket pricing wasn't there for them, so unfortunately EasyJet have pulled from it. We are hopeful that we'll get another airline on it. We're in talks with another airline at the moment, and it's just watch the space for this, but... Sadly, over the winter, we won't have a Belfast route. Other routes, uh, yes, we are in talks on a number of other routes. Unfortunately, at this point, I can't tell you what. Um, but we also have to remember that airlines work quite far in advance. So they're looking at winter 2026 um, now for routes and 2025 for the summer side of things. So we're talking in advance that you won't see anything brand new straight away. And, and how do you sell Isle of Man routes, I mean, uh, in, in terms of persuading air, airlines to, that actually, yes, you really do want to set up uh, a, a new route from the Isle of Man? Uh, it's a lot of engagement, a lot of courtship, go to different places to see them face to face. Face to face meetings are still so important for that. And then it's looking at things like we do surveys with them. So if ever you see a survey that the Isle of Man Airport's put out asking for your feedback, please do give it because it's usually for an airline that will have a number of questions for making sure that that route's viable. It's talking to different businesses, etc. And as I said before, working for, with Department for Enterprise so we can sell that story all together of why we think a route's viable. That is Hannah Lebeo, the head of commercial at Isle of Man Airport. Any thoughts on that? Obviously, we know that some passengers have been affected by the uh, EasyJet decision to pull out of the Belfast route, but there potentially could be some good news on the horizon. One double six, one double seven, or you can email studio at manxradio.com. You're listening to the Isle of Man's quintessential daily news and current affairs roundup. Update on Manx Radio. Now, should theatre-goers on the Isle of Man be allowed to drink alcohol while watching performances at the Villa Gaiety? 
Well, the venue is considering extending its licensed area and it wants your feedback. Well, Lewis joins me now. He's been taking a look at this. Um, first of all, just tell us what this is all about in a nutshell. So basically, the Villa Gaiety, it put out this press release on its uh, on its website, just asking what people's thoughts were about this. Essentially, as you know, at the minute, you can get a drink at the bar during the intervals or before the show. But actually, during any performance, you can't take an alcoholic beverage to your seat. It's looking at like you say expanding that licensed area and that move it said would actually bring it in line with every other theater around the world basically in the modern age that is what typically happens you can buy a drink at the bar take it back to your seat and enjoy the show but it just wants a bit of feedback because as you can imagine it's quite a contentious issue does that mean then that the bar when there is a show going on would always be open then so it says it won't be serving during the show it still will be before and during the interval The difference is now you can actually take it in to the auditorium. What are people saying about this in general? Bit of backlash online, as you might have noticed yourself. People worried about spillages, especially antisocial behaviour. Someone in the office I spoke to earlier said they're more bothered about people rustling crisp packets and sweets and that kind of thing. But uh, one comment that uh, stood out for me on social media, I'm there for the show, not the Prosecco. (laughs) Um, But yeah, I think a a few people a bit unsure about what, uh, what this would actually mean. But there is, like I say, loads of information on the Villa Gate which says it understands the risks such as spilling of drinks and potential unsocial behaviour so it'll be bringing in security and bag checks for specific events and specific events is interesting because one comment I saw was saying no you shouldn't have this especially during you know children's performances I went to go see Oliver last year where there are lots of children involved in the play lots of children watching as well so they are saying this would be for specific events only and if a band's playing for example then people can go to the bar and bring it back into the auditorium. So they are looking for feedback. Where can people find this survey? There is a page on the Villa Gaiety website and then a link to the survey within that. Have you completed it, Lewis? I did it before, yeah. It took about 30 seconds, honestly. You're going to tell us what you think? I'm not going to tell, no. Oh, Lewis, you're so mean. Uh, That link, incidentally, is also on the story on the Manx Radio website as well, so very easy to find. It is coming up to 12 minutes past five. Let's turn our attention to business brought to you by Ramsey Crookle. And just a couple of hours ago, we were told that substantial changes to the board of the Isle of Man's meat plant have been made with immediate effect. Now, the Department of Environment, Food and Agriculture says it follows months of review and consideration with the aim of stabilising operations and production certainty for farmers while also enhancing food security. So what's happened is five new directors have now been appointed, including a new chair, who all have experience in retail, butchery and agriculture. Defa Minister Claire Barber has thanked those who've served on the board until now, adding... I am confident the foundations they have laid will allow the Refresh Board to bring the focus and energy required to build on the progress made to date and bring much-needed confidence as we look to give farmers, butchers and the Isle of Man public the meat plant they deserve. You can find out all about the changes at manxradio.com, including the names and uh, all the details about the new members of the board. And Manx Utilities says its wind speed monitoring tests at Erie Stain Plantation are now complete. Over the past 12 months, data has been collected to allow for various turbine designs at the site. The SODAR device, which was used to measure wind speeds at various heights above ground level, has now been removed and returned to the UK. And the company says it will now be able to accurately calculate energy yields from the proposed development across the whole year for all viable designs. Well, Ramsey Crook will bring us the stock market report and today they tell us that UK and European markets closed higher as investors digested the latest monetary policy decisions from the US Federal Reserve and also the Bank of England. Now, Wall Street stocks were firmly in the green early on as traders celebrated the Federal Reserve's decision to slash interest rates by half a percentage point. Gold prices climbed over 1% after hitting a record high in the previous session and oil prices rose more than 1% after a large interest rate cut really helped Brent recover from the below $69 last week, its lowest all year, to above $74. Well, if we look at the commodities then, gold currently stands up 0.97% at $2,583. Brent up 2.66% at 
$4.82. And at the close, the FTSE 100 was up 0.93% at 8,330. And a short time ago, the Dow Jones was trading up 0.9% at 41,877. And the Nasdaq was up 2.56% at 18,022. I'm running late again. Do you know where I put my car keys? In the fridge. Where's my phone? Under the dog basket. Bye. You haven't forgotten that we're seeing Ramsey Cook all later? Oh, uh, no, of, of course not. Um, 5 p.m., is it? Caught it a free. I'll be there. Life is busy. That's why Ramsey Crookall's team takes time to help you make a mindful investment decision. Considering all the options, giving you full control of your financial future. Less stress, more assurance. Forgot to put my shoes on. Oh. See how we can make your money work for you. Call 717171 or visit ramseycrookall.com. Licensed and regulated by the Isle of Man Financial Services Authority. <laughs> Manx Radio Travel, driven by Keyside Tyres and Service Centre. Well, we're not aware of anything happening on the roads that's really significant, so hopefully your ride home should be pretty good this evening. There will be those traffic lights that are there 24 hours a day in various locations, which are obviously uh, causing a little bit of a tailback occasionally. All looking OK down at the steam packet this evening. The uh, Manxman going out to Haitian, though, at half eight uh, tonight, expected to get to Haitian at around quarter past midnight, and all looking pretty good down at the airport as well. If you want the full list of what's happening around the Isle of Man, you can go to the Traffic and Travel Hub at manxradio.com. Ask how you can spread the cost interest-free at Keyside. It is exactly 16 minutes past five. Hospitality businesses on the Isle of Man will have to ask themselves difficult questions about their sustainability. Now, this is the view of the Enterprise Minister, who says there are still some real challenges facing the industry. But Tim Johnson told us there is a limit to what government can do now that the island has returned to an open economy. What we have to do is have a, have a, a sustainable plan for the future of the hospitality sector. That's asking some difficult questions sometimes. That's, that's businesses having to look in the mirror and ask themselves some difficult questions. It would be wrong for a government to turn around and say, oh, we're just going to throw money at the sector to keep it, keep it going. We need to, and that's why it's important to have that new hospitality group together, because you have those proper conversations about what are the challenges, how can government help, but there's a limit to what we can do, so we need to be targeted, and I think that's why the new local economy strategy, looking at where we can help support and understand where, where the issues are through this group, that's, that's where you start to do things, because it's in no one's interest for us to, be, to put sticking plasters into a situation that aren't sustainable, because those businesses will then just have the same problems further down the line, and that's that is no, that's no good for them, and it's no, it's no good for anybody. It's certainly no good for government either. So let's be honest. Let's have that open conversation. Let's recognise what the challenges are. Let's have those conversations and say, well, what can we do about that? Now, does that mean some businesses will, you know, are, will not survive the, through this process? That's certainly, yeah, that will be the case. But we're also seeing other businesses start up in that space. And that's challenging for those individuals, but we've got to make sure that we're, we're fair and sustainable. Now, that's the Enterprise Minister, Tim Johnston, and he was speaking just after the government conference. We know that that was happening happening on Wednesday and Thursday this week. A lot to digest from that. A lot of strategies and a lot of board announcements were made there. You can find a full list of them at manxradio.com. Phil Gorn's also uh, done a lot of interviews and there will be much more about the government conference on Perspective. And if you want to, a digest of what happened over those two-day events, then you can go to the Manx Radio newscast and just hear exactly what was said. And also Tim Johnston and the Enterprise CEO Mark Lewin will be on Man in Line from midday tomorrow. So if you've got any questions about anything that you've heard that affects their enterprise, then uh, you can call in or you can email in ahead of time to that. 18 minutes past five. As we heard earlier this week, planning approval has been granted for 92 new Dandara houses on land next to the Golf Links, Glenfaber Rise and Castleview Nursing Home in Peel. So we headed out west to find out how residents feel about it, but first got the reaction of Peel Commissioner's Chair, Christine Muckton. Extra people, whether it be traffic-wise, doctors, schools and sewerage, of course, and they're one of the main things that we do offer our objections to. On a personal view, I had lots of inquiries. People are acceptant of new homes and especially enough for first-time buyers. But again, they go back to the infrastructure. I think the public appeal 
welcome more housing, more people, but it needs the infrastructure in there to cope so everybody within the town is serviced properly. People say to me, I'd love to live in Peel. So we know houses will sell, but they still need to have the benefits of moving to Peel. It's ridiculous. Peel is surrounded by little boxes on a hillside and the schools can't cope, the doctors can't cope, the dentists can't cope, the infrastructure can't cope. When will it stop? The Alaman was going to sink one day, all the houses they're building. This was a lovely little fishing village and look at it now. And the houses that Dandara built, if a couple can afford one, they work in Douglas, they shop in Douglas, they bring nothing to the economy of Peel. I don't disagree with it. We need a lot more people in the island, even though we haven't got the necessary doctors and infrastructure. I do think we've still got to try and up our population up to 100,000. Sounds silly, but I think it's got to be, or it'll end up where the younger generation are going to have to um, pay more to keep up the health service and all the extras. And of course it gives work, which is necessary as well. It's too early. Really, Peel should be focusing on getting the sewage treatment plant built before we add any more houses to the infrastructure in Peel. Crazy. I think there needs to be more resources in Peel, more doctors, the sewage system needs to be in place. That's some of the residents in Peel talking about that planning approval which was granted earlier this week for 92 more houses in the town. It's always really interesting hearing from the people who are directly affected. We also heard from the Chair of Peel Commissioners, Christine Muckton. It is 20 past five. Overgrown hedges were on the agenda at the meeting of Moran Commissioners last night. Local Authority member there, John Lovelady, explains some of the concerns. As a commissioner, I think the appearance of the village and the parish we all live in is vitally important to look smart and tidy and welcoming to visitors. You mentioned in the meeting there that you had some safety concerns. Have you had people raise this with you and the board before? One of the main roads, which is the A1, runs through the parish and there's a lot of traffic in, and even though the speed restrictions on the road. Some people don't stick to the speed restrictions, so we've got to make sure that the pavements are safe for minors and elderly people to walk on. So one of the things I'm getting involved in is the hedge cutting, which makes the pavements fully accessible. We're looking at improving the lighting on that road so then everyone's visible. And obviously, we're always talking to the DOI with regards to the tarmacking of the road. How will you be making sure that people do stick to the hedge cutting rules? Well, obviously, there's legislation in place already, which allows the commissioners to enforce but we'd rather work with people to encourage people to maintain the property and the hedge that's on their property so that's how we we would do is work with people encourage but in the end enforce if need to be. That is Moran Commissioner John Lovelady talking to local democracy reporter Emma Draper. It's always a subject that gets people talking. Uh, Sam, thank you very much for your email on that. Uh, and if you'd ever like to get in touch, 166-177 or you can email studio at manxradio.com. Now, as Steve Whiteley double saw FC Isle of Man make it three straight wins and six matches unbeaten as they earned a 2-0 victory at South Liverpool in the NWCFL Premier Division last night. Speaking to the FC Isle of Man club media after the game, manager Paul Jones says it wasn't just the winning goals he was happy with when it came to his team's performance. Clean sheet was really important and we haven't got a great history of, of beating teams uh, lower than us in the league over the last few years so it was good just to just to come away with a with a, a young team, a young squad and, and get a result so I, th- I thought we did really well, um, especially second half. Everyone was a little bit deflated um, last season I think we missed three or four penalties through different people and we lost every game off the back of that and it could have gone that way first half and if, um, you know, South Liverpool just kind of you know, they didn't part the bus because they tried to get up the pitch and counter attack but you know it was difficult to break them down and we had a few words at half time about how we were going to do that and I thought I thought we executed that really well and, and, and shut them down on the counter attack pretty well at times so yeah it, it was a quite a mature performance again from a very young and experienced team in, in the main Hartley gave us a little bit more kind of facing the, their goal and, and Jezza ran in didn't he for, their, for our first goal and created that for, for us so I thought Harley did really well. His legs went. I had a bit of a go of him just five minutes before he went off because he was just stood staring. And I'm not quite sure what he was staring at standing still. But um, yeah, he, he worked his socks off, to be fair to him, as, as did all of them. I think we, we kind of uh, pulsed his leg a little bit with so much more there for, for him. Um, if he can keep doing the stuff he's good at um, and we can keep getting him in the right positions and he's one of the best players in this league and he's scoring goals, which is great, but we think he can do even more than that. So we're going to challenge him to, to do that. 
That is the Ravens manager, Paul Jones. Uh, sports editor Rob Pritchard is here. And first of all, it's just lovely to hear them so happy, isn't it, after what was a little bit of a run before that. It just shows how things can change quite quickly. Yeah, very contrasting fortunes between September and the previous month in August. They managed just one win in six during August. Uh, and now going into they're now six games unbeaten with uh, three straight uh, victories as well. And what's been interesting, speaking to Paul Jones over the last couple of weeks and going into last night's game, was the fact that uh, he and the players, and he was quite honest about this, maybe felt that they weren't actually playing as well as they were in August. And in August, playing some much more attractive attack in football, not getting the results, maybe not quite, in their opinion, at their best going into this month. But they are picking up the points. And at the moment, that has propelled them right towards those promotion playoff spots at still this early stage of the season. Absolutely brilliant. I'm exactly the same when I play football, to be honest. Uh, anyway, elsewhere in sports news? Yes, indeed. Well, uh, to start off, Isle of Man Cricket has confirmed its lineup to take on an international T10 event next week. 14 players have been selected for the side which will contest the Dream 11 European Cricket Championship 2024 at the Katama Oval in Malaga, Spain from the 23rd to the 26th of September. Led by Captain Oli Webster, the Manx side have been drawn in Group 1 where they are joined by Bulgaria, Croatia, Estonia, Slovenia and Turkey. The Alaban's first match in what is known as the Challenger Division will be against Croatia next Monday at 7.30pm local time and you can see the Alaban squad and schedule in full at manxradio.com. Elsewhere in motorsport, sidecar competitors Michael Russell and Jake Roberts have announced they'll be teaming up for next year's Isle of Man TT races. The duo revealed the update whilst discussing their plans for 2025 on Manx Radio's Journey to a Dream podcast. Both had separate duties at TT 2024 before linking up to take on the sidecar class at this year's Southern 100 in July. There they managed a podium finish in third in the shortened first sidecar race before being a retirement in the sidecar championship contest. Well, also in motorsport, Isle of Man trial star Caitlin Adset has finished seventh in this year's Trial GP Women's World Championship. It comes after the team station garage rider finished ninth and fourth in round seven and eight respectively in Spain with the latter of those her highest stage finish of the campaign. Well early this month the team had tasted success with competitor Ruby McCubbin being crowned winner of the ACU Ladies and Girls British Intermediate Championship. And finally the Alabans under 21 netball team is preparing to take on one of its biggest tests to date next week. Alabama netball has confirmed 12 players will make up the squad which will contest the under 21 World Youth Cup qualifying event in Cardiff, Wales from the 24th to the 29th of September. Once there, the Isle of Man will take on five other nations in the form of the United Arab Emirates, Wales, Scotland, Republic of Ireland and Northern Ireland. The Ireland side's first contest of the qualifiers will be against UAE on Tuesday the 24th of September at 5pm. All matches in the tournament will be live-streamed on the Europe Netball YouTube channel and you can view the Isle of Man squad and the team's full schedule on our website. Thank you very much indeed, Rob. Now, we know you've tried sidecar racing. Have you ever had a go at netball? I haven't, no. No? I can just see someone, you doing that. Someone tried to convince me to get into the men's netball here, which has been growing, to be fair, over the last uh, 18 months Which is so, great, but, isn't uh, it? Yeah. Yeah, I, I don't know if I can keep up with it. No, oh, I'll go on. Okay. No, no, I'm not going to say what I was going to say. Uh, Rob, thank you very much indeed. And thank you for your company this evening. That is all from Update for tonight. If you'd like to get in touch with the newsroom at any time, newsroom at manxradio.com. If there's something happening in your area of the island, we'd love to hear from you. Up next on Manx Radio, it's the Archive Room with Judith Lay, then Greatest Hits with Chris Kinley from 6, a little light music with Morris Powell from 9, and then Rianne will be here from 10pm with After Hours. So again, whatever you're doing this evening do enjoy that sunshine if you can it's just such a shame isn't it that sunset is so early and we feel like we've been a bit cheated with the summer but it is glorious get outside get some vitamin d and i'll see you back here at 5 p.m tomorrow